I'm the pastor over Celebrate Recovery here at Generation Church, and I believe in CR. CR is a Christ-centered recovery program that helps tens of thousands of people all over the world. And I also have a personal story of how these kinds of struggles have affected me and our family. We have a son named Sean who was an adorable, curly-haired little boy, precious, sweet-spirited little kid that at the age of 12 started smoking pot. And by the time he was 15 years old, he was a full-fledged addict. By the time Sean was 18, 19, 20, he was using black tar heroin and all kinds of really difficult drugs. And I can't even begin to explain to you how this affected our home, our lives, our family. There were times that Sean would steal from us. We went through a season where we had to put locks on certain doors. We would have police officers in our home in the middle of the night on a Saturday and still have to go to church and preach and lead worship and lead the church. There was a lot of guilt, a lot of questions, and a lot of struggle. And so we understand recovery, and we understand the need for all of us together to find ways to not be stuck in the things that would hold us so tightly. Sean now is incarcerated. He's in jail. He has accepted Jesus into his heart, which is a great miracle. And we are still praying for him and believing in the faithfulness of God because our God is a faithful God, and we know that. We're taking that to the bank for Sean's life. But we understand CR, and and we understand the need for it, and how these kinds of things affect us. And Celebrate Recovery exists to help us overcome hurts and habits and hang-ups in a Christ-centered environment. CR is based on the words of Jesus and also emphasizes personal responsibility and helps us in our growth and our healing. Here at Generation Church, we have CR on both of our campuses. Here at the Mesa campus, we have Celebrate Recovery every single Tuesday night at 6 p.m. right over in the chapel building. We start out with a light meal at 6, then we go in for an actual service-type meeting where we have worship and a testimony or a message, and then after that, we go into open share where we have an opportunity to share where we're at, what our journey is like, and the struggles that we're going through. We have that also, the exact same thing in Ahwatukee at 6 p.m. on Friday nights. And we would just love to invite you to CR. You don't have to sign up. You can just show up. One of the cool things we have here at Generation Church is we have CR Kids. And CR Kids is for kids kindergarten through sixth grade. And it just helps them deal with difficulties around them, whether that be grief or divorce or things their parents are going through, but in a kid-friendly way. And it's an amazing program. So we just want you to know it's there for you. Celebrate Recovery is an incredible, incredible place to go, and it will always be there for you. Now, today we're going to continue to talk about recovery. So I want to say, what do you need to recover from? We know some of us are good right? But we also know some of us carry around things a lot that keep us stuck. And a lot of us carry things that people don't even know we're dealing with. We can deal with drug abuse, alcohol, overworking, overeating, a shopping addiction, which we really shouldn't talk about right after Black Friday. But I already go to CR, so don't judge me. People that deal with grief and guilt and anger, anxiety, divorce, depression, all these things we deal with and celebrate recovery. Sexual addiction, abuse, porn, codependency, people pleasing, addiction to social media, insecurity, gambling, lying, procrastination, having a controlling nature. You see, God does not want you stuck in these things. He has 
freedom for you, and he wants you to experience life. John 10.10 tells us, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. And look at this next translation. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. God wants us to live abundant lives. Full, complete, joyful, free. He doesn't want us to just be survivors. He wants us to be overcomers. God wants us to be winners, not losers. But we have to get a hold of the promises of God. He wants so much for us. But friends, we have to deal with our junk. And some of us live our lives carrying that junk around with us. We wake up with it in the morning. We walk around with it all day and go to sleep with it at night. And I'm telling you tonight, God has more for you. He wants to help us get unstuck from our habits that mess us up, from problems that cause us our difficulties, from memories that we can't let go of. And CR, Celebrate Recovery, is based on eight principles that are taken out of the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. And we're learning these principles with an acrostic. Last week, Pastor Ryan started with R. Realize that I am not God. I admit I am powerless to control my tendency to do wrong things, and my life is unmanageable. Then he talked about the E earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to him, and that he has the power to help me recover. Amen. The next letter in the uh, recovery acrostic is C, consciously choose to, uh, to, <laughs> to commit all of my life and will to Christ's care and control. In 1961, Ellen Shepard became the first American to travel into space. Shortly before uh, takeoff, a reporter asked him, Sir, on what are you depending? And he responded, that God's laws, that God's laws will not change. Isn't that a great answer? I mean, just think if um, gravity only worked on certain unknown hours, right? That wouldn't be so good. But I have so much good news for all of us today. God's laws do not change. In fact, they're immutable. And there's a lot about God that doesn't change. His love for you doesn't change. His commitment to you doesn't change. His word that he's given to us does not change. We can depend in God because he does not change. And if you want to get healthy emotionally, if you want to get healthy relationally, if you want to get healthy physically or in a host of other areas, may I tell you what you need to do? You need to make Jesus Christ the manager of your life. And you need to make the word of God the authority in your life. Can I hear an amen? Listen, we all get stuck in life. We get stuck in relationships. We get stuck in unhealthy habits. We get stuck in grief when we lose a relationship or we lose a loved one. We can get stuck in anger, regret, bitterness, unforgiveness. And, and, and life in general is so sticky. And all these hurts and habits and hangups are sticky. It's kind of like this tape over here. Man, all of life's stickiness is so easy to put on. This tape is so easy to put on. I mean, we just wrap things up. We just go for it. Uh Uh-oh. And guess what? Before you know it, in just a, a few moments, you're stuck. Here, catch that. We're stuck. Well, how do I get unstuck? Well... There's things like celebrate recovery. There's things that, that God has created for us to get unstuck. Like for me right now, one of the things is a tool. It's right here. It's called a scissor. Now, I may really hurt myself right now. Hey, practice makes perfect. 
Here, Beth. Although I'm still stuck a little bit. Oop. Here you go. So easy to get stuck, but it's not easy to get unstuck. It's like a habit. A good habit is so hard to begin, but easy to stop doing. But bad habits are, hard, are easy to get into, right? And hard to stop. It's going to take some effort and a lot of effort on my part to get unstuck with the habits, hurts, and hangups in my life. And once you get stuck, you start feeling burdened with a lot of things. And the first thing you get burdened with is a lot of guilt. You start feeling guilty about being stuck. You say, I wish I could get out of this, but I can't. And so we start having regret and remorse, and we feel weak, and we feel sometimes stupid that we allowed this to happen in our lives. And then from feeling guilty, we can start feeling angry. You want to be free, but you can't, and you begin to get angry with yourself and sometimes the other people in our lives. We get angry at them because we choose to reflect our hurt and our pain on them. Anger becomes another than sticky problem when you have and you have trouble controlling your words and your actions. And then it just gets more complicated. Things get out of control, causing you to say or do things that you soon will regret. So we have guilt. We have anger. Then we have fear. Our, our anger turns into fear, and fear is that distressing emotion aroused by impending danger, evil, or pain. And then all of those things turn into depression, and we're down in the dumps. And that's when, hopefully, we might scream out and cry, somebody help me. I need help. I can't get unstuck. I can't change. I need some help. Breaking out of sticky hurts, habits, and hangups is what celebrate recovery is all about. It's not enough to realize that I'm not God. That's step one. It's not enough to, to believe that he exists and that God is able and willing to help us. We've got to make a decision. There comes a point in our recovery that we've got to cross over the line. And that is third, the third step here, where we consciously choose to commit our lives to Christ's care. And control. But we don't want anybody to control us, do we? The third step is based on what Jesus said in Matthew 11. Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What an incredible invitation. Jesus says, come unto me. Give me, let me control your life. Let me care for your life. And if when you do that, you will have rest. I will make your life easier and I will make your load lighter. In every one of your hurts, habits, and hangups, Jesus offers relief. How do you spell relief? Jesus. He offers release, and he offers recovery. Praise God. You know, no one here today or no one online can make that offer of offering relief, release, and recovery. You can't offer that to a friend. I can't offer it to a family member. But God can. Hallelujah. So what keeps us from taking this third step? It's so important, but what keeps us from taking that step? A lot of times it's a five-letter word, and it's called pride. Pride will keep me from admitting I need help. Look at Proverbs 18. Arrogant people are on the way to ruin because they won't admit it when they need help. It kind of reminds me of myself. 
back in the days and decades, actually, before we had Google Maps, Beth and I'd be driving somewhere and I'd be lost, but there's no way I was stopping. I wasn't a minute. I got this, Beth. I got this. Even if we're late, even if we miss it, I got it. One time we were driving up in Montana and it was for a wedding and we had a couple hours and we were trying to get to Glacier National Park. We never got it because I wouldn't stop. I never saw it. Craziness. Lost but unwilling to stop and ask for directions. Pride will keep you, will keep me, will keep your loved one from admitting they need help. Number two is guilt. There's that guilt thing. David, a man after God's own heart, committed adultery and then tried to cover it up by killing Uzziah. Uh, Bathsheba's husband. In Psalm 40, it says that David said, problems far too big for me to solve are piled higher than my head. Ever felt that way? Meanwhile, my sins, too many to count, have all caught up with me, and I'm ashamed to look up. I'm ashamed to ask for help. Pride will keep us from taking this step. Guilt will Keep us from taking this step. David is saying, I've blown it big time. But here's the great thing about God. There is no sin that God cannot forgive. And there's nothing in your life that God's not willing and able to help you with. So don't let pride, don't let guilt keep you from taking this incredible step of giving Jesus control of your life and also your will and making God's word the authority in your life. That's so important. Paul was writing to young Timothy, and he said this about about fear. He said, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. I think a lot of times we're just afraid of what we may have to give up. We're like the guy who's out hiking maybe by the Grand Canyon, and he trips on a piece of wood or something, and he's falling. And after about 500 feet of free falling, he grabs a hold of a branch somewhere. He looks down, and he's got another 500 feet to go. He looks up, and he sees the 500 feet, and he cries out, somebody up there, help me, help me. And he hears a voice. It's the voice of the Lord and says, just let go and I'll catch you. For a moment, he, you know, no, and he looks down. No, I can't do that. He looks up. Can somebody else help me? (laughs) We're like that guy. We're hanging on for dear life. And yet we're afraid. Listen, we are afraid of what will happen if we give God care, the care and the control of our lives. What are you afraid will happen if you give it all up? You give God control of your life. What are you afraid will happen? When I was 17 and a half, I kind of stepped away from God. I grew up in a really wonderful Christian home. I was loving the Lord, going to youth group, going to church. And then we moved to another city, and then I I, I stepped out, and I, I, I turned my back on God. And I began doing things that young men who are 17 and a half and 18 do when they're not serving God. Got me in a whole bunch of trouble. In fact, I was arrested one night and charged with two counts of conspiracy to commit a a felony. It's because I was doing some real stupid things. But just before that, about two weeks before that, I I was falling apart. Things were going bad in my life, in my heart, and I was totally out of control. And I was talking to our pastor, who our parents had called. It was 2.30 at night. And you know what he asked me? He said, Paul, are you ready to give control of your life to Jesus. And guess what? I was. And he led me in a sinner's prayer. And I asked the Lord to come into my heart and to save me. And he did. And then I got arrested. And I had to deal with all of that. I was sentenced to three years in the Iowa State Penitentiary. 
Now tell me that wasn't a wake-up call. But through the prayers of my family and church, and probably because of my good looks, <laughs> and or that I'd never been in trouble before, they put me on one-year probation, and if I messed up again, I was going there. That was a good motivation not to mess up. But after that, even when I was on probation, I, was, I had a wonderful job on the, on the uh, Burlington Northern Railroad. I had a brand new car. I was involved in ministry in our home church, enjoying it, loving church, loving God, loving life, loving my bank account, loving my car. And I start sensing the Lord wanted me to go to Minneapolis and to enroll in a Bible college to prepare for ministry. And to obey him, I needed to quit my job, sell my car. And I did. And one of the things that the Lord challenged me with during that period, again, now I'm about 19 years old, and I'm getting ready to move up to Minneapolis. And I felt the Lord say, you know, if you really want all that I have for you, you should never date anyone who's not a Christian. And so I made that commitment, and I remember making it, and I honored that commitment. But during that season of waiting. Sometimes, and it was kind of a joke in Bible college that if you just really serve the Lord, you know, you're going to get an ugly wife because that's what God's going to give you. <laughs> and so I was kind of thinking of that. There were, he told a lot of jokes. And um, so I was thinking maybe someone not so attractive would be God's will and a loser, you know. And if I really follow God's will, he'd probably send me to Africa. Well, about seven years into that process, I met Beth, and she fell in, I mean, I fell in love with her. And look at this picture of us. Look at that. So pretty. No, so pretty. <laughs> I kind of look like Donny Osmond there, I think. No, no. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I didn't say that in the morning. Okay, but listen, I lost track. Beautiful, thank you. Beautiful. And if you know her, definitely not a loser, amen? God bless me. You see, God places desires in our heart. And the Bible is very clear that if we commit our way to him, he will bring to pass the desires that he's placed in our heart. But then, guess what? I've been to Africa three times. <laughs> and those trips, missions trips, have been like some of the top highlights of my life. God knows what he's doing. Amen. Isn't God good? Praise the Lord. So what are you afraid of? Afraid will happen if you give God control of your life. Some people will say, well, I don't want anybody controlling my life. But you're controlled all the time by the opinions of other people. You're controlled by hurts you can't forget. You're controlled by habits you can't quit. You're controlled by all kinds of hang-ups. And you know what freedom is? Freedom is choosing who controls you. Yes. And I want Jesus to control my life. Amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Quickly, how can I consciously choose to commit my life and my will to the care and control of Jesus Christ? How do you do that? Just a couple quick things here. Four things. Number one, you do need to accept God's Son as your Savior. I accept God's Son as my Savior. Back in the Old Testament, someone said, what must I do to be saved? And the answer was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. What does that mean, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? It means that whatever you know about him, what he did for you, why God sent him, why he died for you, that he rose again, that means to commit as much as you understand at this moment to as much as Jesus Christ that you understand. You commit to him. You ask him to be your Lord and Savior. That's the first thing that you do, to Give your uh, commitment, you, you commit to the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, I accept God's word as my standard for living. That's made all the difference to me following my uh, commitment to Jesus Christ. 
Look at 2 Timothy. This is an awesome scripture. It says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. The word of God corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. I accept God's word as my standard for living. Number three, I accept God's will as my strategy for living. David said this, I take joy in doing your will, my God. Can I tell you, back when I gave my heart to Jesus, back in like 1974-ish, there's nothing in this world that compares to knowing that you are in the will of God. And there's nothing quite like knowing you're not in the will of God. But when you're in the will of God, there's joy, there's peace, there's fulfillment. There's hardship and trials and pain and all of that. But you know that God's got this and here in, the, in his hand. Can I hear an amen? amen? Lastly, I accept God's power as my strength. Paul writing to the Philippian church, he said this, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. And what, what you're saying is, God, I believe that you're smarter than me. And I give you control, and I will do what your word tells me to do. So one bit, bit, bit of advice. Give God a blank check and let him take care of the rest. Amen. Amen. Next, we're going to talk about a house cleaning step. It has to do with cleaning up the past and letting go of guilt. The O in recovery is openly examine and confess my faults to God, to myself, and to someone I trust. Let's talk for a minute about the big G word, guilt. Guilt keeps us from growing and from becoming all that God wants us to be. Guilt is our way of punishing ourselves. If you're going to experience the abundant life that God has for you, you are going to have to learn to let go of guilt. You see, the truth is none of us are faultless. We all have sinned. We've all made mistakes. We all have regrets. We all wish we could turn back time and change some of the things that we've done. We feel bad about it, and so we carry that guilt with us, sometimes consciously and sometimes unconsciously. We can even pray and go to God and, and kneel down and give him all of our troubles and all of our guilt and all of our past and ask him to forgive us, and then when we're done praying, we get up, pick it all back up, put it on our shoulders, and continue to carry it around. We might deny guilt repress it, blame other people for it, excuse it, or rationalize it. But I will tell you, if you're going to recover from your hurts, habits, and hang-ups in your life, you have to learn how to let go of guilt. Psalm 32, 1 and 2 says, What happiness for those whose guilt has been forgiven? What relief for those who have confessed their sins and God has cleared their record? That's what God wants to do for us. He wants to free us of guilt and clear our record. Why do we need to deal with our guilt? Well, first of all, guilt destroys your confidence. You cannot be a confident person if you're carrying guilt everywhere in your life. It makes you insecure because you're always worried. What if somebody finds out who I really am? What if somebody finds out the truth about me? They might reject me. What if they find out I'm not all that they think I am? As a result, we're afraid of people, and it destroys our confidence. Guilt robs you of confidence. It's like a cloud that hangs over your head, and you're thinking, I can't get on with my life because somebody might find the skeleton in my closet that deep, dark secret that only I know about. God knows, but nobody else does, and we carry it like a heavy weight, and that robs us of our confidence. Guilt also damages relationships. 
It's a cloud that hangs over all of our relationships. It causes us to respond to people the wrong way. It makes us impatient with people. It makes us overreact in anger. Guilt can even cause us to spoil the people in our lives, even our kids. We can spoil them rotten just because we feel guilty. Guilt can cause you to avoid commitment in relationships where you just pull away. You start to get close and you pull away because you don't want anybody to really know you. It can damage relationships. It can damage marriages because people bring guilt into their marriage. Sometimes guilt from things that happened before they even met the person that they're with. Guilt also keeps you stuck in your past. It's like living your life only looking in the rearview mirror. If you do that, you're going to crash the car. You can't always just look back. Guilt tends to make us replay the decisions that we've made over and over and over again. The things you wish you could change, but you're never going to change. Guilt cannot change your past, just like worry can't change your future. It makes today miserable. See, when we look in the past, we see ourselves as the person we're we used to be, not the person God says we are today. God wants us to see ourselves as he sees us today. Your guilt, your past does not define you. Jesus Christ defines you. So what do we do with all the things that make us feel guilty? In CR, it tells us to admit to God and to ourselves and to others the nature of our wrongs. So first we have to be honest with ourselves. What am I hanging on to? What's going on in here? What do I feel guilty about? What do I regret? What do I feel remorseful about? What are the things that I am hanging on to from my past that are keeping me stuck? What in the past is still messing up my life today? Lamentations 3.40 says, let us examine our ways and test them. You see, God's telling us to look at ourselves and examine what is going on. God's telling us to examine our lives and pray and seek God. Psalm 139, 23 and 24 says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test my thoughts. Point out anything you find in me that makes you sad. We have to start with being honest with ourselves. And then next we have to accept responsibility for your faults. Proverbs 20, 27 says, the Lord gave us a mind and a conscience. We cannot hide from ourselves. The greatest holdup to my healing from my hangups is me. The greatest holdup to your healing is you. Not me, it's you. Sometimes we think if I could just change a few things, if I could just stop being married to this person and be married to that person, if I could just get a different job, if I could just move to a different city, if I could just change everybody in my family to another family. The problem with all that is we're still there. Right? We've got to deal with what's inside of us. We have to take responsibility for our faults. We can't minimize it. We can't rationalize it. We can't blame others. Now, let me tell you this. A lot of our hurts, habits, and hang-ups do come from the fact that others have not loved us well. But we can't blame them. We are still responsible for the choices we make today. And we have to take responsibility for that. If I wanna stop defeating myself, I have to stop deceiving myself. We have to stop pretending that it's everybody else's fault when the issue really is me dealing with my junk. It's time to finally deal with it. 
get it over with so that we can experience abundant life that God has for us. The next thing we need to do is ask God for forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we freely admit that we have sinned, we find God utterly reliable. He forgives our sin and makes us thoroughly clean from all that is evil. If we freely admit it, God will forgive us. The basis for forgiveness is God, not me. I don't have to make sure I do everything. He already did it. God is utterly reliable. It's his nature to forgive. Jesus paid the price for our sin. That's why he died on the cross. And we just humbly come to God and ask for forgiveness. Isaiah 118 says, no matter how deep the stain of your sin is, I can take it out and make it clean as freshly fallen snow. That's what Jesus wants to do for us. He makes us clean and he makes us pure, completely clean as if we've never sinned before. That's what happens when we ask God for forgiveness. The next thing we need to do is be willing to admit your faults to another person. James 5.16 says, admit your, admit your faults to one another and pray for each other so you may be healed. How are we healed? By admitting our faults to one another. But why? Why do I need to tell another person? Well, we wear masks sometimes. We pretend we have it all together. We can even play games with each other, deny our feelings. And that isolates us from other people and prevents intimacy in our relationships. We end up living with a lot of shame and insecurity because we think if they really knew the truth, they wouldn't want anything to do with me. And then we get sick in our hearts because we're only as sick as our secrets. The secrets that I hold on to are the secrets that make me sick. God says revealing your feelings is the beginning of healing. When you risk honesty with another person, all of a sudden, this feeling of freedom comes into your life. Because you know what? You find out they still love you. You find out, oh, wait, you've been through all this stuff too? And all of a sudden, the power of those secrets are broken. And we experience freedom and wholeness because we start sharing what's going on in our lives. Now, just remember this. You don't have to tell everybody, just somebody. Okay? We, we, we don't need to make, yeah, you got my point. Okay. The next thing we need to do is accept God's forgiveness and forgive yourself. The Bible says all of us have sinned, all. Everyone in here, we're just a bunch of sinners. Online, we're just a bunch of sinners. Look around you. We're just a bunch of sinners. All have sinned. Say that word with me, all. Nobody is perfect. We've all blown it. We've all made mistakes. It's not like anybody is more righteous than anybody else. We've all got different problems in different areas. We're just at a different place in our journey. That's all. All of us have sinned, yet God declares us guilt-free when we ask for his forgiveness. If we trust in Jesus, he makes us clean inside. Now, one of the things that's important to remember is we have to understand God's forgiveness before we can understand how to forgive ourselves. A lot of times when we have a hard time forgiving ourselves, it's just because we don't really understand God's promise of forgiveness. And when you really grasp the way God forgives us, it's easy to start forgiving yourself because you're realizing that you're holding on to something God doesn't even remember. So how does God forgive? Number one, he forgives instantly. He doesn't wait. He doesn't make us wait. He doesn't make us suffer for a while. He doesn't give us a list of 17 requirements. He just forgives us 
instantly. Second, he forgives freely. We don't earn it and we don't deserve it. It's free. It's free. And third, he forgives completely. He wipes it out. There's no condemnation for those who live in Christ Jesus. And it feels amazing when we really get to the point where we understand that we have no condemnation and Jesus has made us clean inside. Watch this beautiful story with me of God's complete forgiveness. Hi, I'm Jen and I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. So what initially brought me to CR was my addiction to drugs and alcohol. Growing up was tough for me. I lived in a very dysfunctional environment and never quite felt like I belonged. I always had a sense of insecurity. Well, drugs and alcohol took care of that for me. Using and drinking gave me that false sense of belonging, self-confidence, and security I longed for. I loved how I felt when I was drunk or high. I started getting drunk and high regularly at age 14. Even once I started having children and even eventually got married, it didn't stop. It only progressively got worse. My marriage was also extremely unhealthy. He was a violent alcoholic and I had developed FD pain pill addiction. We had it all, cars, boats, and a house. And even though I knew how we were living wasn't normal, I didn't think we really had that big of a problem. So as dark as my life was, on January 26, 2010, my world as I knew it came crashing down. My husband went in for a minor surgery, and even, the sur even though the surgery went great, when I later returned to the hospital, I walked in to find my husband not breathing. He was dead. It was at that moment I hated the God my grandma had so often talked about. How could he do this? How could he take the only normality or only normalcy I had away? I had to go home and tell my young children their dad isn't coming home. I fell deeper into my darkness and addiction. It wasn't long after Dwayne died that the revolving doors of jail and prison began. Everything was gone, the house, the furniture. Clothes and eventually my children. I'm sorry. I will never forget the day in court when I signed my rights away as a mother. A piece of me died that day. By now I required a needle full of heroin to numb the pain. It wasn't until my third time in prison I finally hit my rock bottom. I was done. I was ready and God welcomed me with open arms. Once I re was released, I moved to Washington State and it is then I started my journey in CR, Celebrate Recovery. And Celebrate Recovery is where I've learned and continue to learn about stepping out of denial, doing my inventory, being powerless, and God restoring my sanity and ultimately giving me hope. I had found what I needed. The steps are just a part of CR. You also get the love and support from your brothers and sisters in Christ and sponsorship and accountability. I have been a part of CR for going on seven years. As a matter of fact, in February, I will have seven years clean and sober. I have an amazing husband who also attends CR and a great relationship with my children and family, a job I love, and the blessings go on. CR, so, CR is also about being of service to, uh, to others. I've had the honor, and still do, of serving, sponsoring, and leading groups and step studies. Also, the growing doesn't stop. Once the drugs and alcohol were removed, all the other hurts, habits, and hang-ups came out. Fear, control, and anger, just to name a few. I am definitely a work in progress, and God is by far not done with me yet, so I will keep coming back. Such a beautiful story. And God has abundant life for you in the same way he did for Jen. Your story might not be as drastic as hers, but whatever has you stuck, God wants to unstuck you. He wants you to live that abundant life of joy and freedom and wholeness, free of guilt, God has that for you. And I know how we think, whether you're in Mesa and looking around the room or you're online thinking about other people you know that go to church. I know we think everybody has it together 
but us. We walk in a room like this and we think, you know what, everybody, everybody looks so put together. But I think we would all admit we're on our journey. And we're on our journey together. We're on our journey together to freedom, wholeness, a recovery, abundant life, all the promises of God, all the things he has for us. And he wants that for every single one of you. The first step is obviously, obviously saying, Jesus, be the Lord of my life and letting him come in and forgive you. And some of you might have avoided that just because of guilt. You might think you can't ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life because you've done so many bad things. He couldn't possibly have done this for you. But I will tell you this. He loves you. He died for you. He wants to forgive your sins. He wants you to be his child. And I would just like to give you an opportunity to pray that prayer and ask Jesus to be the leader and the Lord of your life. Can you just close your eyes with me? And if you're watching online or you're in this room, Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus has not given up on you. Jesus wants to forgive you. Just say this prayer in your heart while I pray it and your life will never be the same again. Jesus, I need you. I need a savior. Please forgive me of all my sins and mistakes. Please make me clean inside. Please take me as your child. I give my life and my control and my cares to you right now. And I'm going to live for you from this moment on. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, for those of you who already know Jesus but are experiencing some stuck, things in your life. I want to pray for you because I want this to be the day that you say, I'm hungry for wholeness. I want to seek it. I want to work on my junk. I want to do the things that I need to do to experience abundant life. Let me pray for you. Jesus, we love you so much and we're so grateful for your promises. We're so grateful for abundant life. We're so grateful for all that you do for us. And Jesus, we don't want to be stuck in our junk. So we commit to walk the journey of letting you help us deal with our stuff. Help us deal with guilt. Help us deal with our grief and our addictions and the things that hold us back. Jesus, help us to be hungry, to move past the things that hold us back in our lives. We give them to you. Help us to walk that journey. In Jesus' name, amen.